Um, if there are questions or observations anybody would like to make more broadly about Mina Loy's practice, um, I think maybe we should give ourselves, probably maybe limit ourselves to around 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm happy that our colleagues at the museum are gonna give us a little extra time upstairs until about 5.15. So I, I do wanna make sure, um, since we're so lucky to have this visual art upstairs that we can avail ourselves of it. But I thought George, your question was such a great indication of the ways in which our thinking about Loy maybe help to inform the way we think about contemporary creative projects and vice versa, the way in which creative projects of the present day maybe open up new ways of thinking about Loy. So yes, Nancy. I have a question for Jennifer. Um, if she's really, I, you mentioned earlier, Jennifer, um, that the, uh, the process of putting the show together included in your research, um, uncovering many leads that led to dead ends or, couldn't, or you couldn't follow further or, um, and I wonder, you know, thinking about um, in, the, in the library world, the world of archives, I, I'm always struck by how, um, how reachable the past is, how things really do survive in unexpected ways and surface in unexpected ways. Um, and I wonder what your thinking is about, about the rest of Mina Loy's uh, body of creative visual works and about how, how we all um, might think about um, that process of research continuing or, um, or uh, new works being surfaced in some way, or, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've thought about a lot about this. Um, oh, yeah, so for, for any exhibition of this nature, uh, uh, sorry, yes, sorry. So uh, uh, for a modernist exhibition, um, always once that scholarship goes out, you're like casting bread on the waters. The idea is that hopefully someone's gonna see the show, read the book, read a review, and see an image and realize that they have a connection to something that was connected to Mina. So that that can continue. There continue to be sort of these magical connections person by person um, that will bring new things uh, into the field of scholars for, for study and understanding and fill in the gaps, right? A lot of our conversations are all of these things that we talk about are gaps and how to be, you know, to try to be cautious about making them prescriptive, right? So you can throw out an idea, but there's really not a lot of proof all the time until there's, you know, it's substantiated in some way. So that's one way. Um, the book itself, so in thinking about this being the first retrospective of Mina Loy, really there was, again, only so much that could be accomplished there, um, not to mention that it happened during COVID. So this was a great limiter in terms of a lot of things that could not be followed through on. The ar archives weren't available. I couldn't travel. There were, um, so um, to put into the book as many bits of information that the next generation of scholars, right? There's a whole new set of Mina Loy fans now. This is so exciting. Um, there's just been two conferences that a number of us have participated in, in, in England and in Paris last week. And there's this remarkable field of young scholars who are invested in MENA. And so the bait has been set. Um, and you know there are just a number of dissertations and master's thesis that can happen now um, because there's enough visual image out there for, for people to respond to and follow through on some of those. So that's where, you know, for, for scholars in the room, people's essays are interesting, but their footnotes are really interesting because <laughs> that's where all of the, the, the unanswered leads, you know, who other people that Mina knew um, she encountered that those sort of circumstances. Um, one of our conversations the last two days was someone mentioned a whole suite of people that I really hadn't thought about being approximately to, you know, uh, that just today actually about film and Loy, like what was her connection there? She's not mentioning it, but that there's great possibilities. So, um, so that's one of the great hopes. And then um, again, following through personally on things that we all are interested in and um, seeing where they, they can connect. So um, yeah, there's just so much to be done. A lot of, of I, I would say, so, and, and actually we walked through the show this morning, you know, pockets of work that we know existed, went somewhere specific, and just like we were talking about the fashion, there's a, a drawing in the galleries of a series of, of dresses that Mina designed. We know a whole portfolio of those images went to New York, uh, Carl Van Decken, like, 
And he cared about that. They wouldn't have gotten thrown away. So they either are somehow connected to him. We recited all the places that we thought they possibly could be. And there's so many things in archives that aren't cataloged because they don't know who made them. So it's the, you know, I just did a research on another artist and it was in one port of oversized, um, it was an oversized envelope. It changed everything about, it, it was the key to understanding that unlocked this relationship between two artists. It was, it was just fascinating, this account. And it wasn't in the correspondence because it wasn't I, identified properly. All those things do exist. And then, say, you know, but also to, Vecta knew all of these fashion designers. So did that go to their desk? Or, and, and did it, did, right, I was thinking about that too. It's like, so who were they? Who, who, whose desk, and it could be in their archives, misidentified as that designer's work instead of Mina's. And so that's just one example of numerous things. Or the one I keep talking about in every one of my lectures is like, we know that the Mountbatten family in England had ordered over a dozen lampshades from Mina. So like, can we get into their country house <laughs> at the shore in Sussex? And, and see if there's a you know a, a residual lampshade there that would be so exciting. So anyway, those things, and then then a number of people that she knew there, um, and collections. You know, we know that Fabi's work went into the Queen's collection in England. Did Mina's also? Whose work is, were they misidentified as? I, I, I made preliminary inquiries, but I couldn't find them. So anyway. Jennifer, thank you so much for your comments. And I want to riff off of something um, because you mentioned the extraordinary generation of emerging scholars um, that are, I hope, benefiting from this project. And I know they are. And from the conversations that are also unfolding around the fact that this happens to be the centennial of the release of Lunar Baedeker. Um, so it's just been an ex really exciting moment to launch this show. And we are so grateful for the groundbreaking research that you have done to help bring this visual art out of the archives, out of private collections, back into the public sphere. Um, but we're very lucky to have one such PhD candidate with us from Germany. And Johanna, I know you aren't here to give a talk, but it is so thrilling that you've made a point of traveling internationally to France, to the US to pursue this work. And I wondered if you might just say a quick word about the doctoral work you are doing right now on Loy, because we know that you're one of the exciting emerging voices who will be building this field in important ways. Thank you so much for this spontaneous opportunity to, to speak in my non-native language, uh, give a pitch talk about my PhD thesis. Um, maybe first a few words of thank you uh, to everyone in the room for the talks and for everyone working on the exhibition. I hope I'm speaking for the entire um, rising Loy community when saying that these are exciting times and I've met so many young PhD scholars um, within the framework of the last couple of weeks. I've been to many conferences um, abroad and now I'm here at the exhibition and everyone is just so excited and there is I think um, a lot to come. Um, about my PhD work if I might say a few words about that I'm researching reality constitution in Mina Loy's work. That sounds very abstract and it is, but it's also very exciting. So I'm looking at overarching structures of meaning making. I'm particularly interested in states of pre-mediation and Mina Loy's ever fascination with the state of infinity, ever returning um, to a state where we are then um, able to reimagine reality, but thereby also learning something from our past. So these infinite structures of spiraling up movements of meaning making, um, that will be the summary um, of what I'm interested in. I'm looking at visual artworks and literary artworks at the same time. So also trying this intermediate approach of working things out with visual artworks that um, have just popped up. And um, yeah, I'm hoping that this project will be finished um, in a year or so, and that hopefully you all can at some point enjoy reading it. Thank you so much for the space. <laughs> I, I have to say, I can't think of a more wonderful note on which to conclude our conversation together. Um, I, I, I will 
say, I'll turn the mic to just for one last comment after this, but I do love the fact, um, Johanna, that your reference to um, the infinite actually mirrors Buster Wolf's um, reference to infinity. It seems like a really wonderful way to um, bring the, the circle, so to speak, um, back together. Um, this has been just such a rich intermedial discussion with so many um, creative minds, scholars, poets, musicians, visual artists, um, I feel incredibly lucky. Um, in a moment, and I'm going to turn um, the mic back to an artist, which is probably really the best way to conclude our proceedings. Thank you for being here. Um, we can be in the galleries up until um, 5.15. If there is an artwork that you're eager to see, um, I think I'd urge you to do that. There's a little bit of uncertainty, as some of you may have heard, um, about the weather this weekend. Um, so we know we have power, and um, we know that the galleries are accessible now. So please do feel free to take advantage of um, an, a moment to see the exhibition before we close. But now I'm going to turn the mic back to my wonderful colleague, um, George Lopez, with thanks to him for being here. I wanted just to take a moment to celebrate both my personal experience and I think something we're all experiencing. Relevance is such a big thing for many young people in education who maybe don't know, we don't have a perspective on all the things in life and in our educational experiences that are, will be or are relevant in the moment or in the future. And one of the experiences I've had that's so important for this whole project, I had meant to bring Mina Loy to life and bring an actress into the gallery, having her portrayed in period costume. And that was step one. But I don't think I fully experienced her spirit and the relevance of her for this moment until Buster came, Buster Wolf. I think there's something really important about finding those links to the living, uh, where I, um, as a musical archeologist of the classics, don't always fully experience those artists now, except through their music. This has been a wonderful experience and I so thank all the people involved. And I think, I don't know if you coined the idea of loyalists, Roger. <laughs> But you introduced that to me, and I think we've created a lot of new loyalists, and I would like to recommend to, to have Buster Wolf brought back to Bowdoin and really have him be a larger part of the Mina Loy dialogue, uh, especially for the students who really should have uh, experienced that uh, and, 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 and create a whole campus of loyalists. So thank you all. Craig Dork, and I'm going to put you on the spot. So Craig is a, an old friend, a poet, a professor, and we've talked about Mina Loy for decades on and off. Uh, the last time we saw each other, I think, was with Charles Bernstein at University of Pennsylvania, and she was part of our discussion. And this exhibition, which is still only prospective and speculative at that point, was also part of our conversation. But Craig is someone who's both a, a poet and who writes about visual art, and he, he, Craig is also one of my authors at MIT Press. Can you say how seeing this exhibition has changed the way you see Mina Loy's poetry or the way you are going to read her in the future? Or, yes, uh, your reaction, I'd be very curious to know. Yeah, um, you know, I, I can say from experience, I have no idea yet because I'm going to be thinking, uh, yeah, thinking through tonight and thinking, thinking for the next few days. But it goes back to the un untidiness, actually. Um, and it reminded me that, you know, one of the things that just to make possible academic arguments and making arguments is you have to get rid of all the untidy stuff and the stuff that doesn't quite fit and maybe put some into footnotes but um so much of that is leaving stuff out and so much of this exhibition was about bringing things in um that i i liked the way that it it shook up shook up things that i'd in teaching and in writing that i'd made too tidy 
um, and want to remember the things. Things are never. Things are always. Anytime you can tell the story, it's it's much it's much cleaner and less true than anything that's actually there. Um, and I love that about the the exhibition. Um, yeah, the gritty and the gritty. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. And perhaps with that wonderful um, invocation of the question of how this work might influence our creative vision going forward, we'll um, conclude our formal proceedings. I know that these conversations will continue to unfold this afternoon and going forward. Thank you all for being part of this really rich discussion. It's been so much fun. And if anybody wants to take um, a quick peek um, at the exhibition or a favorite work, please feel free to do so. Um, although we've promised that we'd wrap up by about 5.15 in the galleries. Thank you so much for being here.